again. It's good to be with you all. I want to welcome everybody, of course, to church. Glad that you're here, especially if it's your first time, if it's your first time watching online. We're glad that you are joining us. Uh, We are wrapping up a series today, and uh, that's okay if it's your first time, because each of these kind of can stand alone, and I can bring you into the context. But we've been on a journey for now, like six weeks, and uh, this series has been really feeding me. I hope it's been feeding you. It's always a good thing to travel through, walk through an entire book of the Bible, and I'm hoping now uh, that by the time we're done today, you're going to feel like you know First Timothy better than you've ever known it before. Uh, but before I get to the actual message, let me just do a quick follow-up on uh, last week's uh, affirmation of our elders. I wanted to give you kind of the results of that, just so you know as a church. And so after uh, all three services, uh, we had a 100% affirmation of the leadership of our church. So that's worth celebrating, yeah? Uh, when I say 100%, I mean literally, you know, it, it was all uh, affirming and uh, there was only good comments. There was actually uh, no, you know, dissenting votes, no people with concerns, and that's the process that we want to go through every single year, just so we make sure uh, that our leadership uh, is is in the right position. And I'll tell you what that says. It says two things. Number one, we've got a great team of elders uh, we need to be thankful for. And number two, we've got unity as a church. And the number two things that you got to have in a church to be able to successfully uh, expand the kingdom of God is you got to have a strong leadership team and you got to have unity in the church. And so we're batting a thousand and I couldn't be more thankful and we really should be appreciative and thankful that God has blessed our church in that way because let me tell you, that is not the case in most churches across the world. And so I'm very thankful about that. But I just wanted to give you that follow-up before we jumped into things. And so let's get to the end of this letter. I'll tell you right now, this is probably my favorite section of the letter and, and this is why. It, it's at the very end, and it's kind of a sleeper section. It's like if you were reading through this, you'd think, okay, all the meat's right at the beginning or in the middle. And, you know, at the end, you, you kind of sign off and say adios in a letter. And there can't be that much important stuff there, but there is. And so this is a really, really powerful section of Scripture And let me tell you how I would describe it. I I would say this last section that we're going to look at is a basic battle plan for any Christian who wants to survive this crazy world that we live in. A world where everything's coming at you and everything can go wrong and it would be really easy to, to walk away from the faith or to hold on to your faith. If, if you're struggling right now with your faith, If you're asking yourself some questions like, does God care? Does any of this really matter? Um, This is a message for you. It's a message for all of us because it really is a basic battle plan for you to be able to make it through this crazy world. And so uh, with that, I want you to open up to the section, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We got halfway through chapter 6 last week. We're going to cover verses 11 through 21 today. If you don't have your Bibles or an app on your phone, you can use the scripture sheet that's in the seat uh, that you're sitting on to follow along with us. And let me just kind of give you a little bit of context uh, in case you weren't here last week of what was in chapter 6 verses 1 through uh, where we're at today, 1 through 10. Last week, Paul was reminding Timothy, remember this is a letter from the Apostle Paul to a younger protege, Timothy, who is a pastor at a church in Ephesus. And he has been coaching him on how to effectively lead the Christians there in Ephesus. And he was warning Paul, or he was warning Timothy, that uh, false teachers uh, are leaving sound doctrine and making up junk and leading people down the wrong path. And they're doing it all for money. They're greedy, they want the attention, and they want money. And, and, and Paul was saying, I don't want you to be this way, Timothy. You can't lead this way. You need to be content, and you need to preach sound doctrine. And so the first half is all about how bad the false teachers are, and you'll see a shift here in verse 11. So let's look at the first verse, and uh, verse 11, I should say, and a little bit of 12. It says, but you, see there's a transition, but you, they were this, but you, Timothy, man of God, flee from all this. 
and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Now, right here in just a verse and a half, we're kind of stopping in the middle of 12, but right here in that little you know, few sentences, there's a lot of punch, big punch here. Uh, there's, there's some commands here. There's actually three commands, and I, I use that very specifically, just like I used a battle plan for life, because Paul, this whole letter, has been talking as if he's a, a drill sergeant to a soldier. He, he, he sees himself as a soldier for the Lord, and he takes his job very serious, and he's telling Timothy, you need to take your job very serious, because this is life and death. And, and we've been commissioned by the Lord to preach the gospel, and we got to get this right. And so there's a lot of that kind of language in Paul's writing and in his tone. And right here he's saying, but you, man of God, you need to do this and this and this. And there are commands, and there's three of them. And the first one, if you want to jot it down, is to flee. The first command is to flee from all of this. Flee. Now, the, the, the word flee for us in our language, uh, there, there are two connotations to that word. There's a good connotation and a bad connotation. The bad connotation of flee is, is a mark of, of cowardice. Right? If, if you are to flee your responsibilities, uh, if you're to bail on uh, you know, a person, and that would easily be seen as, as an act of cowardice. I, I was watching a movie uh, last week where there were all these soldiers down in a deeply dug trench. It, it was one of those trenches where if, 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 if you wanted to get out, you had to climb up a ladder. And, and if they did go up at all, even if their helmet went above the, the trench line, it got shot. You'd get killed. And so they were hunkered down in the trench. It was trench warfare. And, and this was a true story, by the way. And, and it was at this moment in time where uh, the, the sergeant came out or whatever the, the commanding officer was in that particular situation. And he said, look, we're going to blow the trumpet. We're going to blow a whistle. And everybody's going over this wall. And you're heading for the Germans. And you're not stopping until you kill them all. And, and if any of you... Bail, if any of you flee from the battlefield, uh, if any of you come back to the trench, this guy has been assigned to stay behind and shoot you dead on your return. You are going this way and you're not stopping until everybody's dead on that side of the field. This was a true, true, true story, actually. And, you know, I was just thinking, I mean, whoo, I mean, the pressure there, but like everybody got the message. It would be a bad thing to flee your responsibilities in that situation. That's the, that's the negative connotation of the word flee. But there's a positive, a good con connotation to flee as well. When it's used in this way, the good side, it's a mark of wisdom, not a mark of cowardice. A mark of wisdom is to know when you're in a bad situation and flee from sin. If I put myself in this situation, it is going to lead me to do something that I shouldn't do. And so, oh, okay, I need to flee from that scenario. That, that, that's a, a good connotation. That's a mark of wisdom. You know when to get out of a bad situation. So you got to be careful which way you understand it, but Paul is, of course, using it on the positive side. He's telling Timothy, you need to have the wisdom to flee from false teaching and having a greedy heart. You need to learn to be content. You need to flee from all this. That's what he's saying to Timothy. But what is he saying to you and me? Well, he's saying you must flee from situations that tempt you and will lead you into sin. That's what we need to understand about this. Uh, too often, we flirt with sin instead of fleeing from sin. The ultimate example of the good connotation of knowing how to have the wisdom to flee is Joseph. Remember Joseph? Joseph in the Old Testament if you ever read through Genesis, you'll read about this guy who gets sold into slavery by his brothers, and he ends up being bought by a family uh, where he works for a guy by the name of Potiphar, and uh, you know Potiphar trusts him with everything. In fact, he says, just 
oversee my whole household, and usually Potiphar wasn't there. And, and when Potiphar was gone, Potiphar's wife took a liking to Joseph and kept trying to seduce him. And she wasn't real subtle about it. In fact, one passage in Genesis says this, she caught Joseph by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. I mean, she wasn't mincing words, right? She wasn't trying to, like, you know, be subtle in any way. And what was Joseph's response? He left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. I always imagine, you know, this, you know, real gaudy, uh, you know, Egyptian woman with all kinds of jewelry and her hair's all hair sprayed up and she's like trying to seduce Joseph. She's got her hands all over him and she's like trying to get his shirt off and he's like spinning out of his cloak to get the heck out of there because he knows Anything goes down here, not only am I going to be disappointing God, but Potiphar's going to come home and shoot me dead on the spot, right? And so uh, he literally spins out of his cloak and just runs for the hills because he knows he needs to flee this situation. And that is how we need to view sin in our lives. We need to recognize that sin is serious. It's not to be flirted with. It is to be fleed. Uh, I don't even know if that's the right tense there, but you know what I mean. You need to run away from it, right? Uh, and you need, you need to understand that that's why in our white flag strong acrostic that we have posted up all over our building and we do a teaching series on it every few years, uh, we, we, we have a T, S, T. What does the T stand for? Anybody know? Tackle sin. And the tackle sin is this aggressive idea that you need to uh, admit that whatever God says is sin is sin, not redefine it in your life, not flirt with it, not be okay with it, but aggressively distance yourself from that sin. You need to flee from it. And listen, it'd be great if you could just figure out what are the areas in your life that tend to tempt you into sin and avoid them altogether. I mean, there are going to be situations where you just find yourself, didn't know this was going to happen, but I know this is wrong, let's get out of here. But, but if you could just, on the front end, avoid them all together, you'd be even better off. That's the best way to flee it. It's to make, a, make an escape plan before you even get into the situation. Let me tell you, um, some of you, uh, it will look different for each and every person in here because we're all tempted by different things. But like, let's say you're dating someone right now, and you both have an apartment or a house, and and sometimes you go over to his, and sometimes you go over to hers. And, and when you're there and you're alone, it, you know there's always this temptation where you're, you're, you're like, you know what, why, why don't I just stay the night? We won't do anything. We'll just sleep in the same bed and cuddle. We won't do anything. Like, that's flirting with sin. And everybody's shaking their head out there because many of you have used that kind of processing in your head and thought, nah, no, we're just gonna, you know, we, nothing will happen. It will happen. And so you, you might need to just say, that's something that I need to flee from. We need to not be alone while we're dating uh, in each other's houses late in the evening because we can't trust ourselves. That doesn't make you like uh, weird. That makes you wise, makes you wise. May, maybe there are some of you who have a group of friends that every time you go out with them on the weekends, you end up at a bar drinking too much. You need to recognize that pattern and flee from it. And you just go example after example after example, um, but you got to do that work in your own life and flee from sin. So that's the first command, flee. Paul says, Timothy, for you, you need to flee from false teaching and from you know, being uh, consumed with making money and being wealthy. You, you need to flee from that. But the interesting thing is you can't just flee from something and that solve everything. You've got to flee from sin to something better, right? If, if you're in the darkness and you want to get out of the darkness, uh, you don't just run. If you do that, you'll, you'll run into a wall, okay? You're in the dark, right? You've got to run towards the light. And so the second command is to follow. The first is to flee. The second is is to follow. You, you might be looking at the text and say, well, where is that word? I see flee, but where is follow? It says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue. Pursue can also be translated here, follow or hunt. 
So think about those words, follow, hunt, pursue. That, that, that sounds like, you know, something that is active, something that's aggressive, if you will, to hunt something. It's not casually you're looking in a direction of kind of following, but you're intensely following, pursuing, hunting. And what is it that, that Paul suggests Timothy should pursue and follow and hunt? He says righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. These are six virtues. If you were wondering what to work on in 2023, uh, here are six virtues that you should follow and pursue with your life. Not just flee from the bad stuff, but follow the good stuff. Now, what do these words mean? Let's take righteousness. That's the first one. Simple definition of righteousness would be um, you see the word right in righteousness. So righteousness is the idea that you are in right standing. You're, you're doing the right thing. But, but that's just a basic kind of little part of it. What really I think Paul is suggesting here is pretty powerful. He's telling Timothy uh, to pursue righteousness. And I think what he means is he's saying Pursue what you became in Christ when you gave your life to him. Now think about that. When you become a Christian, you hand over your life to Christ. He forgives you of your sins. He washes you anew. He makes you into a new creation. And by the power of Jesus' blood, and only by the, the, the grace of Jesus, are we made right or righteous. We become righteous, which allows us to be able to approach God. Otherwise, we can't approach God because God is holy. We are not, but he makes us right, righteous, so that we can. So what Timothy is needing to understand here is Paul saying, you need to pursue, you could say it this way, pursue who you are in Christ. Not who you were, but pursue who you are. Pursue righteousness, the thing that Christ made you in an instant when you surrendered your life to him. Pursue that. It's, it's called sanctification is the fancy word for it. And it's the process of you've been saved by Jesus and made right, but you're still on this planet which has fallen and you still have old habits and now you spend the rest of your life eliminating those bad habits and becoming more like Jesus. That's sanctification. So you're becoming more like your actual identity, which is righteousness. It's a little confusing, but I hope that made sense. Paul's saying, pursue that which you've been made by Christ. The second thing is godliness. This one's easy. Godliness is about your conduct, your behavior. It honors God. He says, pursue that. Faith. Faith is trust in God, confidence in God, loyalty to God. He says, pursue that. Love. This is a love for God, a love for people. It's the two greatest commands. Love God, love people. You, you need to pursue that. And, and this is an agape, sacrificial, sa uh, self-sacrificing kind of love for people. Endurance. Endurance, you know what that means. It's sticking with things when they get tough. Uh, another word, another phrase that's often used in Scripture is long-suffering or patience. That, that you need to pursue this endurance that you're going to stick with God no matter what. Follow that as you are fleeing the other stuff. And then finally, gentleness. The sixth virtue uh, uh, is similar to meekness, which you've heard me teach on a lot. It's uh, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. You've got power. You can get revenge. You can be angry. You can shout at people. You can let people have it. But what Paul is saying to Timothy is you, you need to pursue and follow gentleness. So you flee and you follow and the third command is you fight. You fight. Fight the good fight of the faith. Now, what does that mean, fight? I mean, fighting, there's a lot. Okay, now he's saying to fight. He just, you were just talking about being gentle. 
Where's the, who are we fighting? Let's go. What, what are we doing? Who are we fighting? Well, this is not a fist fight. And, and we know that because it says fight the good fight. It's not a good fight to go get into a fist fight with somebody. So what is the good fight of the faith? What is, what is Paul talking about? Well, he wants Timothy and us to understand that living for Jesus isn't easy in this fallen world. It's not easy. It's not always a cakewalk. And there's going to be hard work. And there's going to be challenges. And you're going to have to stay focused because there's going to be all kinds of distractions. And, and you're going to get knocked down. But you're going to have to get back up again. They ought to write a song about that. You get knocked down. And then you're going to have to get back up again. And, and that's going to happen time and time and time again. But you've got to keep pursuing Jesus. So fighting the good fight of faith is just understanding it's going to be a fight, a dr- knockdown, drag out fight all your life to stay true to Christ. You don't just wave your white flag and surrender and, and give your life to Jesus and it's easy. Man, you've got to fight for this. And so... Paul is just reminding Timothy of that. Now, what does it really look like to fight for your faith? Because again, this isn't like, okay, so then, so then as Christians, we show up in an alley and, and there's some, you know, some non-Christians and we're just going to fight them and we're going we're gonna to not let them say anything that would make us bail on Jesus. And, you know, it's, it, it's not even that. It's really about fighting through the hard questions of life that that cause you to question God and then bail on him and you're going to have lots of these questions lots of these questions like you know why did my brother have to die a couple days ago was the you know two-year anniversary my my oldest brother just dropping dead you know he's a he's a a marathon runner and run two marathons in the the month uh, that same month he had run two marathons and then he's sitting at you know, a computer one morning and literally just falls off the chair and dies, dead at 60. Right? Why, why, God, did that have to happen? Uh, why do people who do bad things get away with it, God? Where's the justice? Why do I have to have this, this disease, this cancer, and go through all these trials and try to balance all the medicine when you could heal me at any time. And, I, and I've been praying, but, but nothing's changing. I'm just getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Why, why, God? Why is our government so corrupt and so untrustworthy? Why, why, why do my kids have to be exposed to so much conversation about sexuality? You see, this is life. There's all kinds of tough questions, and you'll probably have more, you know, something more unique than that, but maybe you have all those questions and some other questions that, that you face in life, and you start to question God and faith and how things work. And, and then you put on top of all that the physical challenges of just living on this earth, the emotional challenges, the relational problems that you'll experience with people and, and you'll get to the place where it would be real easy to bail on God and not fight the good fight of faith. The fighting that takes place more often than not is not with somebody else. It's within your own mind and within your own heart. Because can I tell you what a lot of people do? A lot of people you know, struggle with these questions and then they bail. That they say, why, why did my brother have to die? Well, you know, if he dies, and, and this is the way it works, God, you must not really be a good God. I'm out. Why, why do I have to deal with this cancer? You're not answering me. You're not giving me any sign that you're here. So, I mean, if you're not interested, I'm not interested. If, if people get to do bad things and nobody's held accountable, then why should I be so concerned about doing the right thing? There's no justice, so I'll live whatever way I want. And they bail on God. I don't want to have to deal with this issue of sexuality with my kids. The easiest thing to do would be just to go with the flow and then I can do whatever I want sexually and I don't have to ostracize myself from certain friends or have any problems with my children or choosing the wrong path sexually. And It'd be a lot easier if I just rolled with everybody else and did and thought and said, hey, everything's fine as long as you don't hurt anybody. That would be easier and people bail 
on God. And so this is what fighting the fight, the good fight, is all about. You've got to wrestle with these questions and at the end of the day say, I still trust Jesus. And I'm going to not bail on God. I'm going to fight. And I want you to look at what Paul says uh, to Timothy in the second part of chapter, uh, of verse 12. So the second part of verse 12, we stopped right in the middle of verse 12. But now he says this, Timothy, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, speaking of God, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in an unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Now that is a powerful section of scripture where Paul is closing this letter out and he says a lot there and I want to walk you through what he's saying. You see, part of fighting the good fight is to take hold of, or another way to translate that would be grip onto, right? To cling to, to grab eternal life. Hear that again. Paul's saying part of fight, he's just said fight the good fight. And now he says to do that, you got to take hold of eternal life. Like take hold of eternal life this gift that you've been given by Jesus, the way you would hold on to the edge of a cliff that you just slipped on and you're dangling, your feet are dangling and all that's holding you to that wall is your grip, your fingertips connected to that rock. How hard, how firmly, how focused are you in that moment if you're dangling for your life pretty intensely? a strong grip you're going to be holding on as tight as you can possibly hold on and that's what Paul's saying to do he's saying hold on that tightly don't stop keep holding on to eternal life if you if you look there at 12 as it kind of trickles through 13 Paul is reminding Timothy of the moment that he waved his white flag the very first time to Jesus The moment of conversion uh, in front of his family. He's taking Timothy in this, you know, he's giving him these three commands. Flee, follow, and fight. And and now he's saying, in this fight, you got to take hold of eternal life. I want to take you back to the very beginning. See how he says it? He says, um, take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Go back to the very beginning when you, when you surrendered to Jesus. And I want, you to, I want you to remember that. And now I want you to keep this command. He, he says, in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and in front of Christ Jesus, in front of God and in front of Jesus, I want you to fight and I want you to hold on. And what is he saying? It's so cool here. He's saying, what I want you to hold on to is eternal life. And the only way that you can hold on to eternal life is to hold on to God. Hold on to Jesus. You you did it once and you got to keep on doing it. Because that is your only hope of surviving this world. The moment you let go, you are falling to your death. When you're on a cliff or when you're walking with God, you can't let go. You got to keep fighting the good fight. And what's so beautiful about this section of scripture is he says in so many words, keep holding on to God because if you've forgotten, God gives life to everything. God controls the timing 
of everything. God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's above everything. He's immortal. He's unapproachable. Well, that makes it a little bit confusing. If he's unapproachable and you need to hold on to him, how how, how can you approach him? Well, remember, if you gave your life to Jesus, Jesus made a way for you to approach the throne by covering you with his blood. So God is unapproachable, but not for you as a child of God. You can approach God with confidence and you can hold on. And so, so he's saying God gives life to everything. God's timing is over everything. God is above everything, and he's immortal. Look back at that. I just want to read it again. It's it's a powerful section of scripture. Look at verse 13. God, in the middle of 13, God, the blessed and only ruler, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in an unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. That's what you're supposed to be holding on to. And and here's the kicker. If you hold on to this God, you have nothing to be afraid of. Timothy, remember, is 30 years old. He's at the capital city, right? The biggest city around. It, It is a church that was already established by his mentor, Paul. Paul's now around 70 years old. Timothy has been assigned as a 30 year old, which in their construct in their culture you were not you were not even considered an adult until you were 40 and yet here he is 30 this is why timothy earlier said uh, paul said timothy don't let people look down upon you because you're young but you got to go in there and lead this church with an already established group of elders who are older than you but you're going to lead them and lead all the people and there were all kinds of problems there there were false teachers and timothy is is at a shaky moment in his life. That's why this whole letter is being written, and now Paul is concluding it by saying, Timothy, you have nothing to be afraid of. If you just remember all the way back in front of witnesses when you waved your white flag and said, I want to give my life to Jesus, you took hold of eternal life in that moment. Keep holding on to it, and don't forget Who you're holding on to controls everything. So yeah, you got a problem. Whatever's thrown at you, it's not insurmountable. It's not bigger than God. Whatever a person tries to throw at you, hey, you're going to be able to get through it if you just keep holding on. Keep fighting. Keep holding on. If if you need that message today, um, hear it loud and clear. I don't know of a better message that any of us can hear uh, on as we approach a busy week where it's just a guarantee something chaotic in your life is going to happen during this holiday season. I don't think it's by chance. I think the devil works overtime to bring heartache and pain in the, in the Christmas season because it's a time where we get to focus on the joy and the peace and all the good stuff that comes with Jesus. And the devil will try to redirect your focus and your attention and try to get you down because he wants to destroy you. And so this is so timely for us. Paul wants Timothy to flee, to follow, and to fight. And that's what he wants for all of us. See, this letter is not just written to Timothy. It is titled 1 Timothy. There's another letter, by the way. But but this is... The, the first letter, and it's to all of us, though, because at the end of the letter, Paul signs off by saying, grace be with you all. Grace be with you all means to all the people in Ephesus that Timothy was going to read this letter to. See, the letter was written to Timothy, but then Timothy would read the letter to his church, and then guess what? They would pass the letter around, and all the other churches in other cities would read this letter because it wasn't just for Timothy. God had the wisdom to know that all of us would need to hear this truth. Flee, follow, and fight. Now, we wrap up this whole series by just simply reading the last few verses. It's the end of the letter. It's where Paul is literally signing off. He's already talked about all of this, so it's just kind of a quick review, and he then signs the letter off. And I think it's appropriate for us to 
you know, read it together uh, so that we can uh, say that we went through this whole book. So follow along with me here uh, and notice the use of the word command. Paul's still not done telling them, get in there and do this and tell them to do this. But look at verse 17. Paul finishes by saying, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He's already talked extensively about this, but it's just a great reminder at the end. Make sure people understand it. Whatever they have, they are rich, and they are rich because God has blessed them, and it's not all about money. And then he says, command them to do good, to be rich. It's not about money. It's not about being rich. It's about doing the right thing. So command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. God wants us to be rich in our behavior and our love more than he wants us to be financially wealthy. So be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. You know, if you just participated or maybe even in advance participated in this Christmas offering, uh, you did something good. You separated yourself from your money. You, 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 you acknowledge that God is more important than money. You gave to a kingdom cause. That was a good work, a good deed. And, and you'll be blessed because of it. God wants you to be rich in that. And not just a financial gift, but also doing good to others at the end of your life. He wants you to be able to look back and go, man, I, I, I invested my life well not, I invested well and I'm rich financially. I mean, you know, that would be great, but not at the expense of not actually being rich in good deeds. And then verse 20. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing, have departed from the faith. Once again, he just says it one more time. Don't be like these false teachers. Don't be like the people that go around in the world and say all this stuff that is truth when you know it's not truth. Isn't it interesting that in scripture, it's even talking about what we're dealing with today. You know, in our world today, we got person after person, you know, news coverage after news coverage, celebrity after celebrity, scientist after scientist, coming to us, telling us baloney, trying to get us to believe that it's true. Listen, if the world's saying it, it's a lie. And it's so sad that so many believers have to be convinced by fellow believers that when the world tells you something, it's a lie. It's all a lie. Everything. Everything's a lie. I, got, I mean, I won't go down that line, but let me, let me just tell you, everything is that the world tells you is a lie. And, and Paul's having to say it to Timothy right here. He's saying, yeah, they'll call it knowledge, but you stick to the truth, and we've got the truth. We are at such an advantage. I mean, Paul didn't even have this. We have all the truth that God wants us to know right here. Every time somebody tells you something on the news about sexuality, uh, about morality, you can go, uh, let me just double check that. And it will take you five minutes to find in the Bible something that says the opposite. And the better that you know this Bible, the better you'll be able to spot the lies. One of the things that I've noticed the most over the last three to five years, which seems to be in my lifetime, a time where more lies have been told than ever before, is the, the, the lag time for so many Christians who don't know their Bible. That's why there's a lag time. You should be able to listen to it and go, wrong, wrong, wrong. But a lot of people are like, I don't know, that sounds pretty good. That sounds, I think that's right. And then they get mad. Guess who then a lot of Christians get mad at? A lot of Christians get mad at the people that do know the Bible who say, no, 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 this is bad. We don't even need to pray about this. It's bad. And then they're like, okay, I don't know. And then three years later, they're like, yeah, I think that was bad. Well, welcome to the truth, right? Listen, and you don't have to listen to what I have to say. I say this all the time. You think I'm full of it, 
right? You think I don't know what I'm talking about? Great. Read your own freaking Bible. You have access to prove me wrong every time I open my mouth. Just come up to me and say, hey, you're wrong. And here's why. Bingo. Right here. And I'll go, oh, I, I didn't mean to say it that way. Or maybe I, miss, I didn't try to say that. But, but listen, the power that we have here that goes neglected is, is shameful. And, and Paul's talked about this all throughout. But here he's saying, just one more time, Timothy, Timothy. Guard what has been entrusted you because this thing, they're going to try to bury this. They're, they're, they're going to try to manipulate this. They're going to try to come up with laws to cancel this thing out. And they're going to call it knowledge. But you just guard this truth. Because really, if you don't guard it, I mean, this is the early days. There is no Bible. If you don't guard this, if they don't keep that letter that, that Timothy receives, if he doesn't teach it and then share it, it doesn't get eventually put in the Bible, right? So God is telling Timothy through Paul, you guard this, and we need to guard this as a church. You know, we, we don't have a corner on the truth. We, we don't want to be the church that says we're the only one that's telling the truth. All we got to do is mind our own business and know what is the truth and not be afraid to stand up against media, culture, and false teachers who call themselves Christians. And so, with that, Paul ends and says, grace be with you all. What an appropriate ending, because we need grace. Paul knows, like, okay, this is what you're supposed to do, but there's no way you're going to do it perfectly. And so, grace be with you all. And with that, I would leave you with the same encouragement. Grace be with you all. Let's pray. And then we're done. Father, thank you so much for your truth and for your word and for this series it's so, it's so good to just uh, get, get our minds fully wrapped around uh, an entire uh, book of the Bible and, and to be able to put it in our, our files, in our mind, and in our hearts so that we can draw on it uh, as we live this life. Help us to do exactly what uh, you encouraged Timothy to do. Help us to flee and follow and to fight in whatever way that looks like uh, for each of us in our individual lives, Father, and just... Would you protect our church family uh, during this holiday season? Uh, would, you, would you draw close? And I, I don't even have to pray it because your word already declares it, that you're close to the brokenhearted. There are a lot of people in our church right now, Father, and you know well, uh, good and well uh, that they've lost a loved one. They're, they're dealing with a, a sickness, and they're not getting answers. Uh, there are, there's relational strife and conflict and heartache and... Uh, we just we, we want our church family to be able to sit in the peace and the joy of this season, and they can't do that without you. And so I just pray that you would draw close to them, as your word says, and that they would feel your presence. And we just thank you so much for your word. It's life. It gives us life. It gives us direction. And we love you, Father. It's in your son's name that we pray. Everybody says amen. God bless you.